Hello book lovers and welcome to Book Talk Radio Club. My name is Claire Perkins and today I'm talking to Jim Nesbitt. Jim is the author of hard-boiled detective novels, The Last Second Chance and The Right Wrong Number, featuring Ed L. Birch, a cashiered vice homicide detective. Jim's third novel, The Best Lousy Choice, will be published very soon. Let's find out more. Hi Jim, welcome and thank you for coming on Book Talk Radio Club. Well, thank you Claire, and thanks for having me here and it's a pleasure. Thank you. So, what are hard-boiled detective stories, and where does the hard-boiled come from? Well, I, I think that's a, a distinctly American uh, form of a, a crime fiction, the crime fiction genre. Uh, I think it kind of arose in the 30s and 40s almost as a, an anecdote to the predominant crime fiction of the time, which was you know, British cozies featuring amateur detectives, uh, you know, solving uh, crimes uh, in the parlor of a great mansion uh, with elaborate dedu- deduction. Uh, you know, Tarpool tends to feature a stark realism, grit, uh, you know, amoral characters, uh, uh, characters that may not have uh, uh, very many uh, redeeming qualities, including the protagonist. Uh, but the protagonist, in doesn't necessarily have to be a detective, but usually is, um, has a code uh, and uh, uh, one that he may or may not remember to live by. Nice. Um, Raymond Chandler, I think, defines the, the genre best in uh, his essay, The Simple Art of Murder. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's typically an urban setting, but not always. Um, and uh, uh, it, it you know, features, you know, uh, high, uh, emphasizes things that are real rather than things that are kind of posed. Ed L. Birch is an ex-vice and homicide detective. Why was he cashiered out of the force? Well, partially because he's a terminal smartass who never knows when to shut up. <laughs> but uh, he was also blamed for his partner's death, unofficially. And, you know, he got a suspension when his partner got killed, and they never really forgave him for that. Uh, he's insubordinate. Uh, and the, the ultimate reason, or I guess the, the, the trigger act uh, to use the boot him off the force, was to, he beats hell out of a pimp who badmouths uh, the murder of one of his whores. Uh, and uh, being a guy who used to work vice, uh, Ed Earl, uh, one time uh, uh, the poor got killed, uh, took pity on him and took him home for a little uh, uh, carnal nursing. <laughs> what kind of man is Ed Earl Birch? Can you describe his character? Well, when I set out to kind of create him, I had no idea whether I'd be creating a durable character, strong enough to carry you know, two or three books, but... Uh, um, my thinking about him was that uh, I wanted somebody who was not super smart like Sam Spade or Philip Marlowe and uh, not super cool like uh, Steve McQueen's Frank Bullet. Uh, I wanted uh, kind of an everyman. You know, Ed Earl's been knocked around by life. He's been kicked off the force. He's lost the badge that gave him a kind of sense of purpose and higher calling. And he's, uh, when you first meet him in the first book, he's kind of withdrawn into a, a well rutted uh, pass between a ratty old office, his favorite bar, and his uh, apartment. And he's kind of pulled the, pulled the, uh, the walls around himself and hopes that he won't get you know, further better. Mm. Of course, he winds up uh, realizing very shortly that that uh, his walls are nothing and he's uh, forced to confront reality um, through the course of the last second chance. What I wanted, and I think I wound up with, is uh, somebody who is nobody's hero, but nobody's fool. And where did the Edel stories take place and why? Well, you know, we talked about this before we uh, uh, came on air, and I spent a lot of time as a journalist uh, knocking around the West Texas and the Big Bend country, you know, the border between Texas and Mexico, and just fell in love with uh, that country. It's very, it's, uh, it's, you know, the, 
basically an extension of a Chihuahua desert coming up out of Mexico with uh, a lot of mountains, uh, a lot of mountain chains that kind of collide there. It's a really stark, harsh, but strangely beautiful country. Yes. Uh, looks like the kind of the bones of the earth have been ripped up so you can see them. Yeah. And uh, I just think that's the perfect setting for what is basically uh, basically our tales of revenge and redemption uh, in all three books. I love the titles of the books. They're very clever. And the last second chance and the right wrong number, and then your third one, the best lousy choice. The, as I said, they're clever. Tell me about them, please. Well, partially it comes from uh, one of my favorite songwriters, uh, uh, a fellow named John Prime, who has a uh, unique ability to walk you right up to the verge of an expected cliché. And then he reverses it on <laughs> and, and, and so that, that's partially it. Uh, for the first novel, um, Texas often got described, particularly before it became a state, as uh, the land of the last second chance. Uh, oh. A lot of people who went bust um, in elsewhere in was, you know, the, the, the young United States mm. would go to Texas to try and Rebuild. Certainly, uh, people like Travis, uh, one of the commanders of the Alamo, that's what he was doing, running away from failed business, businesses in South Carolina and a failed marriage. So that, that kind of, I knew that from, you know, from history, and, and uh, that seemed to be a natural um, thing to call the first book. Uh, and then it just kind of set a pattern for creating that uh, reversal from an expected Sure. You obviously enjoy writing in this genre. Are, are there any particular authors that inspired you? Well, I get accused of writing uh, like James Lee Burke on occasion. Not that I'm anywhere near in the same league as that uh, giant, but uh, uh, based because of my tendency toward purpley prose, uh, <laughs> I like to describe it as, uh, as uh, descriptive rather than purpley. Uh, but I think if I had to pick one guy who influenced me the most, it would be the late, great, and underappreciated James Crumley. Yeah. Uh, his books are just jewels and very literary. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, you can read like the, the Last Good Kiss and uh, Dancing Bear, and even his later novels, uh, The Final Country. And, border snakes um, what uh, I learned from, from probably was uh, uh, it's okay to let things rip in terms of frank and graphic descriptions of sex and violence um, I've come to believe that you know, you know, my books are very, very frank and graphic uh, and I don't do that for shock value I do that because I think uh, engaging in euphemisms are uh, insult to the reader. So uh, that's what I learned from Crumley, and, uh, uh, and I'll stand uh, uh, behind the Crumley accusation if uh, <laughs> they manage to remember to include James Lee Burke's name in, in, in the same breath. Prior to becoming an award-winning novelist, you were a journalist for more than 30 years, serving, serving as a reporter, editor, and roving national correspondent for newspapers and wire services. How easy was it for you to switch from one style of writing to another? Well, actually, I, I didn't change styles all that much. I came up in the era, came up in journalism in the mid, mid to late seventies, and it was the era of long format magazine-like stories where you use fiction uh, devices and scene setting and rich description. Wow. Um, so that wasn't really all that much of a switch no. uh, for me. I've always been a storyteller. I come from a long line of storytellers. Um, and uh, I've always had a good ear for uh, the, the quote that defines uh, the, the issue at hand, which is, you know, a good ear for dialogue. Yeah. And uh, an eye for uh, the land and uh, how it shapes the people that live there. So uh, it wasn't that much of a stretch. I didn't know what I was doing in my first novel, and it was kind of relied on story 
storytelling techniques that I've always used, and that seemed to turn out okay. And so I've just rolled and gained more confidence uh, in book two and book three. Right, right. So let's talk about your first Adele novel, with Lowe's Second Chance. Would you like to give Book Talk Radio Cups listeners a brief description of the story? Yeah, like I say, I, I, I didn't set out to write a series, but I wound up with one. So, <laughs> uh, and, and all the books are kind of uh, standalones. Uh, you, you don't have to have read one to enjoy Book Two or Book Three. Right. But this is the book where you meet Ed Earl, and uh, he's kind of at his. Uh, Lowest point, so to speak. He's a, you know, he's a, a defraud, homicide uh, cop. He's making a living as a, a private investigator, chasing down uh, financial fugitives from the oil and real estate savings and loan bust that really uh, ripped uh, Texas and most of the Midwest and Southwest in the in the nineteen eighties. Yeah. He's doing okay, but it's really work without a honor to him. Uh, he takes the occasional divorce case, which really, you know, <laughs> really disgusts him. But, uh, you know, he keeps by trying to make a living uh, and trying to stay, keep his focus narrowed down so he doesn't get whacked around by life anymore. Um, uh, that enters Car- Car- uh, Carlos who can't throw me all pointing a 45 at him and uh, Winds up getting framed for murder, and they both wind up uh, uh, on a fugitive run across Texas and into Mexico. And before Ed Earl finds out that walls aren't worth a flip, and he also finds out that he still has the the, the, the internals that made him a good cop. Mm. And he's very surprised to find out that he still has the instincts, the orderliness, uh, the sense of uh, outrage and uh, right and wrong that uh, uh, defined him as a detective and he's very surprised to find out they're they're still there. I love the description of Carla Sue Cantrell. She's a short blonde with ice blue eyes and a taste for muscle cars, crystal meth and a high wide double cross. What part did she play in The Last Second Chance? Well, I meant her to play a very minor part just to get the action rolling and uh, uh, um, but she just kind of leapt off the page and uh, took over the novel and became, uh, well, it's, I think she's as equally important to that novel as Ed Earl is. Mm-hmm. And they, they wind up being kind of partners in crime, uh, and they both want to uh, revenge, they both want to uh, uh, kill the same guy, this uh, drug lord named uh, Teddy Roy Bonifacio, who I call him T-Roy for short. Uh, T-Roy was responsible for Ed Earl's partner's death and uh, was responsible for the death of Carla Sue's uncle. So uh, they both have a common blood cause. Um, and uh, I think the, the interplay between the two of them, they're both kind of come from hillbilly stock. Um, and... Uh, Sharp, tough, smart ass people. Uh, I think their their back and forth and their insults and their relationship kind of define the book as well as define each other. The second Adele book is The Right Wrong Number, which has been described by another crime author, and I quote, as gritty as number 36 pan- sandpaper. I love that. So, what does Adele get up to in The Right Wrong Number? By the way, that. kind enough to uh, uh, review the book, and uh, I really cherish uh, Bill's kind review and, and that great line. <laughs> it um, really is a good line. I love it. Uh, in the right wrong, wrong number, you know, Ed Earl is, uh, you know, he's kind of regained his footing. He's back in Dallas. He's doing the same kind of work. Unfortunately, he's still deeply in debt and uh, needs money. And he gets a phone call from an old flame, um, uh, Savannah Crow, who has uh, got a terminal taste for larceny and betrayal, and, and one of the reasons why uh, 
federal is in, so deeply in debt. Uh, and he doesn't want to take uh, uh, her call and uh, doesn't want to take uh, any business from her. Uh, but he's so broke, he's got to. He winds up uh, agreeing to do essentially an executive protection thing. She's uh, her, her husband is on the run. Uh, was a, a financier in Houston uh, who uh, had uh, a rather shady clientele and included uh, New Orleans mobsters. And he's uh, disappeared and uh, ripped off the mob, and, and uh, people are coming gunning for her. Uh, that starts uh, yet another wild trip across Texas. Uh, Edero forgets his code, and, uh, and he winds up, uh, at first, going for the money. He's uh, wanting to partner with uh, Savannah, even though he knows he can't trust her. Um, but the action winds up uh, getting his best friend in Dallas killed, and that uh, causes him to remember his code and uh, start gunning for revenge. The best lousy choice. When a rich rancher and war hero is killed in a suspicious barn fire, the rancher's outlaw cousin hires Birch to investigate a death the county sheriff is reluctant to touch. Thrilled to be a manhunter again, Birch forgets something he used to know by heart. When is this due to be published, Jim? Sounds good. Well, um, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm hustling through the production uh, uh, hurdles right now. Got the cover art pick, and uh, it's uh, at my formatters uh, uh, over at studios in Australia. They they do great work. Uh, uh, I'm pushing for uh, late May, early June release. Who is the target audience for your books? You know, I, it, you know, it's uh, middle aged guys like me is what I thought. Uh, when I wrote these things, but uh, uh, I'm surprised by the number of women who buy the, uh, both books and, and, and like them. Uh, it's uh, you know I, I tend to have strong women characters in uh, 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 in both books. Um, you know I think uh, uh, I, I think I don't know why. I mean I didn't, something I did consciously, but the, the Carla Sue and Savannah Crow seem to strike a I know you enjoy a good cigar and an aged whiskey. What else do you do when you're not writing? Well, uh, as often as I can, I fire up a 1972 Oldsmobile Cutlass uh, Supreme convertible and uh, uh, grab my fiance Pam and we uh, take off, ride the back roads. May or may not have a destination in mind, but uh, we just love driving around. I love your writing style, and it seems I'm in good company. Nesbitt is a natural storyteller with a taste for half-bitten wine, which he serves up a chicken fried flair. And this author has settled high on my list of best newcomers. What advice would you give to new authors over your genre? Well, I think it's the same advice I'd give any any new author. Um, You know, you uh, you just have to keep that button in the chair and stare at the screen and write um, and I think you know remember something I learned a long time ago as a journalist and that's facts are your friends uh, they, they, they tell you that uh, um, you know write what you know uh, and I think that's the worst piece of advice you can give a writer I think you, you, you start with what you know but then you want to learn more and you do that by researching by and even if you're doing a a fantasy or dystopian novel, you need to think through and, and do some research and, and design that world so that you, you know, you know what, what you can do, what you can't do, what, uh, you know, what technology is available, etc. Sure. Uh, so that you have authenticity. The more facts you can bring to, the, the, uh, uh, to your writing, the firmer the foundation of and in a kind of counterintuitive sense, it really frees up your writing. No. Uh, you know, you 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 don't you don't uh, pay slavish attention to the facts, but you use them as a springboard uh, for your writing. 
Lastly, Jim, where can Book Talk Radio Club's listeners purchase your books? Well, the easiest way is to look me up at uh, Jim Desmond Author on uh, Amazon. Uh, and right now I'm running a $2 off sale for both Kindle and uh, paperback versions, kind of a pre launch sale. Uh, and you can also go to my website, which is uh, 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 HTTPS uh, called backslash backslash Jim Nesbitt books dot com all one word fantastic well thank you Jim that was terrific please come back and book to uh, Radio Club again I'd love to chat with you here how are you getting on in the meantime good luck for the future and thank you everyone for listening to Book Talk Radio Club thank you very much Jim thank you Claire it was a pleasure and enjoyed it immensely thank you bye now <laughs>